Mark chapter 4, verses 35 to 41. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with them, and a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was asleep in the stern on a cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and the sea. Peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was great calm. Then he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear. And they said to one another, Who is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Would you bow your hearts with me for just a moment, please? Holy Father, in these next few moments, I ask that you take these poor, pathetic words of mine and infuse them with your meaning that you would teach your people the message you would have them to hear, and that you would, above all things, Father, glorify your name. In Christ's name. Amen. This is the text immediately following what we talked about last week. And we talked about last week... um, The text in chapter 4, leading up to this, Jesus is teaching. He's preaching. He's delivering the parables. We talked about the parable of the the soil, the the parable of the sower, with the parable of the mustard seed. You remember that grows into the, 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 the gigantic tree and the birds take refuge in its in its branches. We talked about what that meant. This is the text immediately following that. And as one who is still new to the pulpit, I, I've, I've been here less than two years, I want to tell you that preaching two sermons a day is tough work. It doesn't look like it. It doesn't look like it because I'm just standing here. and Sometimes I walk over here and how exhausting is that? It doesn't look like it's hard work, and I thought that it wasn't. I thought, wow, you know, that that guy just gets to stand behind that desk and talk for a little while, and then he's done. What a great job! (laughs) A day of ministry is exhausting. And in the army... There's a regulation, an army regulation, that says that an army chaplain may see no more than three counseling appointments per day. Those counseling appointments last generally about 45 minutes, right? So, realistically, with an army day, he could see 10 or 12 of them and still get time for lunch. But the regulation says that an army chaplain may see no more than three counselees in a day. Why is that? It's to protect the chaplain. Because when you, when you deal with ministry on that type of a level, you take on the burdens of the people that you're counseling. And that's our job. And I love that. That's what God has called me to do. That is what God has designed me to do from the moment of my conception But it's tough. It's even tough for the Son of God. Christ is literally exhausted. We I I used to think, well, he's he's God, right? So he doesn't really need to sleep. He's playing possum in the boat. He's just sort of, you know, letting them sleep. Fret because he knows he's going to. No, he's tuckered out. He is beaten. He is whipped. Every week, 
at evening service, I come in and one of the questions I can count on being asked was, did you get a nap? And I love that. I love the opportunity when I have it to take my Sunday afternoon naps because I feel much better in the evening service. Christ has been preaching all day at this point. It, and it's not just preaching. It's not just, you know, teaching the people. He was, they pressed in on him so hard that he had to climb into a boat and shove off from shore so they couldn't press in on him any harder. And he's been standing in a boat on the Sea of Galilee, rocking all day, teaching. Okay, now, the Sea of Galilee has some very special geography. It's a very low Lake, and by that I mean it is 700 feet below sea level, 698, 700 feet below sea level. On one side, it's bordered by a, a very mountainous region. On the other side, there are some sloping hills that come together in a valley at the middle of the lake. What this does is it makes a natural corridor for the wind. So that when the wind blows, it comes into that valley, right across the lake, and then it hits those mountains and it swoops up and causes great turbulence. When you look at the Sea of Galilee, it's eight miles across. It's a very, it, it, I, I would call it a lake. Uh, lake Erie is much bigger than the Sea of Galilee. But with that eight-mile stretch of water, because of the special geography, because of the way the wind blows in, terrible storms can arise very suddenly. But not that bad. I mean, who's in the boat? Peter. Andrew. James. These are professional fishermen. They've not just been fishing their whole life, they've been fishing this lake their whole life. If anybody knows about the Sea of Galilee, it's these fellows. So this storm comes up, and it's such a terrible storm on this tiny lake, that even these professional, experienced fishermen, who have more experience with this very lake, then any other spot in the world are terrified. They are in a state of absolute panic. In fact, they're panicking so hard. They are so afraid. That what do they do? They grab Jesus and say, Don't you even care? that we're dying. Just stop and consider that for just a moment. Did you ever look up into the heavens at God and say, don't you even care what's going on down here? I remember. <clears throat> I was in college. I was uh, living in a, in a house between Nelsonville and Athens. And my best friend, who was also my roommate, knocked on my door. And I got up and answered the door. I, I, would, I had been asleep because I was a lazy bum in college. I got up and answered the door at about 9.15. And Andy was standing there in his underwear and his face was white. And he's, he's a red-haired Irish kid. So when his face is white, you really notice it. And I said, what's wrong? And he said, come here. And we walked into the living room. Just in time to see the second plane hit the second tower of the World Trade Center. And we stood there in terror and shock. And I thought, where is God? 
We found out later that 3,000 Americans lost their lives that day because they decided to go to work. And I thought, where is God? And I heard people, I heard people speak up and they say, if God was loving, if God was good, he would have stopped those planes. How terrible do things have to be that we should accuse Christ of not caring about us? At 8.02 p.m. this past Wednesday night, a young man named Dylan Roof entered the historic Mother Emanuel African Methodist Episcopalian Church in Charleston, South Carolina. He was wearing a fanny pack in which was hidden a 45 caliber pistol with several clips worth of extra ammunition. There were 13 people in the church having Bible study. And for an hour, Dylan sat and listened. Even though he was the only white kid in the room, he was welcomed with open arms because these were the people of God. An hour into the study, Dylan stood up pulled his pistol and began firing and firing and firing. He reloaded his weapon five times. When he was out of ammunition, he turned and walked out the door. On his way out, he met a woman hiding behind a table. He said, did I shoot you? And she shook her head. And he said, good. I need someone alive to tell this story because I'm going to kill myself. Then he walked out, got into his car, and drove away. Of the 13 people in the church, eight of them lay dead, and one, the pastor, lay mortally wounded. He would later die in the hospital in surgery. His name was Reverend Clementia Pinnicky. The others were Sharonda Coleman Singleton, Cynthia Hurd, Taiwanza Stan Sanders, Myra Thompson, Ethel Lee Lance, Reverend Daniel Simmons, Reverend DePayne Middleton Doctor, and Susie Jackson. The following morning, Dylan Roof was apprehended by the police when someone recognized his car from the police report. He has confessed to those murders and is now awaiting trial. So back on the Sea of Galilee, the apostles are in panic. Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? There's a fantastic painting, and fantastic isn't the word to begin to cover this. Painted in 1633 by an artist named Rembrandt van Ren. Everyone recognizes his name. The painting is called Christ on the Sea of Galilee. In the painting, <clears throat> you can see the boat. And the boat is riding up on a wave at about a 45 degree angle. And people are panicking. There are three in the front <coughs> trying to trim the sails. One in the front is clinging to a guide rope, just trying not to fall into the sea. Three, fearful, appealing to Jesus and accusing him. One kneeling at his feet, his hands clasped in prayer, one vomiting over the side of the boat, one holding the rudder, trying to guide it. And if you count the faces in the painting, you will find there are 14 people in the painting. Twelve apostles. Christ himself is the 13th in the painting, and he's just waking from his slumber. 
But right in the middle of the painting is the 14th man. The others are dressed in brown or gray robes or, or, or light blue, but they're dressed in, in robes. This man is wearing a shirt. And he's got a pink hat on. It's a French beret. And with one hand, he's holding on to a guy rope, and with the other hand, he's holding his hat onto his head against the wind, and he's staring straight out of the painting, looking at the viewer. It's a self-portrait of Rembrandt Van Ren. He painted himself into the boat. Why? Not out of pride. No, he's, he's a very tiny character in this very large painting. He paints himself into the boat to show that he is in the boat with the apostles. And that if he, Rembrandt Van Ren, in 1633 is in the boat with the apostles, so am I. Are you in the boat? Are you rocked by the storms of life? Are you frightened by the terrible, murderous act of the evil man in Charleston, South Carolina? Are you worried to come to church? Are you afraid of a visitor walking through our doors with murderous intent? Why are ye so fearful, Christ says? How is it that ye have no faith? And then, in the middle of it all, Christ stands. And, and images, depictions I've seen of this in, in movies and in, in paintings, they all have him standing boldly and holding out one hand to the wind and shouting, Peace! Be still! But I don't think that's what happened. Of course, the text doesn't say, but I don't think he needed to be dramatic. I don't even know if he stood up. But he looked out at the water and he said, Sophia, pefimoso. Two words. Sophia, pefimoso, peace. Be still. And we know from the story that the wind and the waves obeyed him. The storm immediately went silent. The water settled down. But was the terror of the apostles lessened? No. No, for the first time in this passage, Mark takes the time to tell us they were terribly afraid. After Christ says, Sophia Pefimoso, after Christ says, peace, be still, Mark says, they were terrified. They looked at each other and they said, who then is this? That even the wind and the sea obey him. Peace. Be still. Emmanuel has come, and God is with us. The following was posted this morning on the CNN website. The site of a horrific mass killing will become a house of worship again. Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church in Charleston, South Carolina, will hold service at 9.30 a.m. Sunday, according to CNN affiliate WCSC, nine people were shot to death Wednesday night in the church. Authorities said Dylan Roof, 21, of Lexington, South Carolina, admits he shot and killed the people he'd sat with for Bible study at the historically black church, two law enforcement officials said. 
Roof is white and all of his victims are black. He told the investigators he did it to start a race war. The church premises remained a crime scene and was thus off limits to church members until Charleston police released it yesterday. One of the victims was the church's pastor, the Reverend Clementia Pickney. Reverend Norvell Goff, the presiding elder of Emmanuel AME, told CNN he will give the sermon at the morning service today. Charleston, nicknamed the Holy City because it has so many churches, will remember the shooting victims in other ways. At 10 a.m. Sunday, many churches plan to ring their bells, WCSC reported. On Sunday night, that is tonight, a unity chain will be held on the 13,200-foot-long Arthur Ravenel Jr. Bridge. Organizers hope to attract enough people to hold hands to stretch from Charleston to the town of Mount Pleasant on the other side of the Cooper River. <laughs> When something this horrendous happens, this close to home, you are compelled to do something, event coordinator Dorsey Fairbarn said on, her, on the Facebook page. On Friday, Roof appeared at a bond hearing. Families of the victims addressed him and said they forgave him. That message was echoed by Arthur Hurd, the husband, husband of victim Cynthia Hurd. He's in the Merchant Marines and arrived in Charleston on Saturday. Christ is in the boat at Mother Emmanuel, African Methodist Episcopalian. How easy would it be for this little congregation to shake their fists at God and to say, Don't you care that we are perishing? But God is in the boat with them. In the midst of their tragedy, God is in the boat. He's there, weeping beside them. He mourns their loss with them just as surely as he mourned the loss of his friend Lazarus. But he's in the boat. Of this, we can be certain. And for this, O oh Lord, we give you thanks. Amen.